Crows and Sparrows dramatizes a parable of power. Tiny sparrows, if they band together, can drive off a larger crow, which might harm them individually. The arc of the film's drama, which is set mostly in a Shanghai row house, has the dispossessed weak banding together to defy an established power. This fantastic film, made at a political turning point in modern Chinese history, is epochal in a couple senses. Plot events take place between late 1948 and January 1949, during the latter part of the Chinese Civil War, and several months before Mao Zedong would proclaim the founding of the People's Republic of China on October 1, 1949. In this video for Chinese film classics, we'll review the plot of Crows and Sparrows and talk about three things. Its unique production context, its use of a multi-family apartment as a device to structure the narrative, and its characterizations. These elements work together to create an allegory of common people again becoming masters of their own house. In the next video, we'll focus on how the film interweaves a drama about dwelling with a drama of exodus, specifically the expulsion of villains. Let's talk about production first. Crows and Sparrows began shooting in 1949, but it was shut down by nationalist censors after half a month due to alleged problems with the script. Filming resumed after so-called liberation, with Zheng Junli taking over as director and, according to one film magazine, working to strengthen the content of the script. The result was an exaltation of collective resistance, which dovetailed, to stick with the bird metaphors, with the contemporary communist ideology of popular uprising. The film thus offers an allegory supportive of the Civil War's victors. China's masses had risen up to drive off their oppressors and again become masters of their own house. From the opening credits, Crows and Sparrows self-consciously projects an ideology of collective production and problem solving, which became a political imperative after 1949. The screenplay was a collective work, Jiti Chuangzuo, by six industry veterans, led by head screenwriter Chen Baichen. The film opens in Shanghai at the end of 1948. As the civil war is turning in favor of communist forces, smaller battles for survival are being waged by several families who inhabit a Shanghai row house. On its ground floor live Mrs. and Boss Xiao, Xiao Laoban, a gossip also known as Little Broadcast, Xiao Guangbo. They support their three sons by buying and selling canned goods. Across the hall lives Mr. Kong Wen, an old man who owns the building and for many years has had no news from his soldier son. On the second floor above Mr. Kong lives Mr. Hua, a school teacher, and Mrs. Hua and their young daughter. The apartment above the Xiaos and half a flight up from the Huas is inhabited by Miss Yu Xiaoying, the kept woman of a nationalist official named Ho Yibo. Mr. Ho has appropriated the entire building from Mr. Kong and is now trying to sell it. When the other residents see Miss Yu showing around a prospective buyer, they realize that they all face eviction and they encourage Mr. Kong to assert his right of title. But Kong has seen a lifetime of bad news in his work at a publishing house, and he has little hope. He points out that the traitorous Mr. Ho has wormed his way back into the central government, and has had Kong's son, a patriot who fought against the Japanese invaders, branded as a communist as a pretext to confiscate their property. The others ask Yu for moving expenses, but she simply orders them to leave. Mr. Hua considers moving his family into his school, even though there is a staff protest and teachers are being arrested. The substitute principal offers to help him, but only in exchange for informing on his colleagues. Meanwhile, Yu hints to Xiao that Ho might be willing to sell the building to him for three gold bars. Mrs. Hua, overhearing their conversation, goes to Yu's apartment, but encounters Mr. Ho, and Ho invites in this beautiful housewife and reassures her that her family won't have to move. Later, Mrs. Xiao brings you a deposit for the apartment. This deposit consists of jewelry, penicillin, and other valuables, and then drags Mrs. Hua over to the Ho residence for a game of mahjong. Ho arrives unexpectedly and continues to ingratiate himself with Mrs. Hua by purposefully letting her win. Meanwhile, the principal offers an ideal apartment at school to Mr. Hua, but Mr. Hua turns it down when the principal asks him to retract a protest letter from the teachers. Hua is then livid when he returns home to discover that his wife has been gambling with Ho and neglecting their daughter. Mr. Hua goes to school the next day during a teacher strike 
and is arrested along with over two dozen others. Ho sends thugs to smash up Kong's room and evict him. Xiao negotiates an extra week for him, though. Mrs. Hua tries in vain to seek help for her husband from a lawyer, the Shanghai Department of Education, and from the regional military garrison. Finally, in desperation, she approaches Ho, who agrees to help, but instead he takes her out and tries to force himself on her. The Xiaos, seeking to exchange their assets for gold, get seriously injured during a riot outside the bank. The Hua's daughter falls critically ill with tuberculosis, but Ah Mei, the Ho's maidservant, saves her by stealing the penicillin back from her employers. The next morning, things are looking up. The Xiaos are recovered and read news of peace. Chiang Kai-shek is in retreat, and they expect that Ho will soon follow. Then, they read that the price of gold has more than tripled due to the imposition of a stability fee. Mrs. Xiao attempts to get her deposit back from the Ho's, but this fails, and Ho plans to sell out and evict them all tomorrow. Kong and his neighbors defy him, just as Ho receives a call ordering him to flee to Guangdong with the money he has been hoarding for his superior. He instead books plane tickets for himself and Yu to go to Hong Kong. On the outskirts of town, his car passes a van that disgorges Mr. Hua, released from prison, who is ordered at gunpoint to walk home without turning around. He stumbles back to join the festivities at the apartment, saying that he no longer fears even the spy who followed him home. The next day, January 28, 1949, this extended family of neighbors gathered together to celebrate the arrival of the Lunar New Year. In terms of form, Crows and Sparrows is structured like a stage play that keeps the national drama off stage. War is presented obliquely, without any of the battlefield explosions or street fighting depicted in films like Spring River Flows East from 1947. Domestic conflicts, above all, a fight over housing, occupy center stage. The spatial and social milieu is first signaled in the opening credits, which appear over charcoal illustrations of dark Shanghai alleyways, an iconic urban setting familiar from earlier socio-political exposés like the film Street Angels. A title card in front of an illustration of the Bund then frames the story in very castigatory terms. Winter, 1948. Our People's Liberation Army has completely wiped out the enemy in the Huaihai region. At this time, in Nanjing and in Shanghai, lackeys of the thuggish Chiang Kai-shek clique in their death throes intensify their oppression of the people, even as they make preparations to scatter like chickens and flee like running dogs. Following on this sweeping historical commentary, the first shot of the opening scene brings us down to the level of micro-history, as the camera zooms in on a newspaper advertisement. For sale, cheap, superior two-level Shi Kumen row house with fully installed telephone and utilities, offered by Mr. Ho at 23 Renkang Alley, Linsen Road. A man responding to the ad rings the front doorbell, and the next shot takes us inside. A book appears in close-up, and the camera tracks back to reveal Yu Xiaoying reading on the couch with Ah Mei reading over her shoulder. From this room, dominated by a bed and a mirror, a tracking shot takes us down to the first floor, where Mrs. Xiao parallels the camera's vertical movement by climbing down a ladder from the loft to her family's bustling, busy apartment. The mobile framing presents one half of the building like a proscenium stage, while the sound design contrasts the idle upstairs with the singing, shouting bustle of downstairs. The prospective buyer then becomes a narrative device to show us the other rooms of the building, introducing the main characters of the drama one by one and establishing their physical relationship in the space of a few minutes. The use of the apartment building as a narrative structuring device is a modern trope connected to the housing pressures caused by urban migration. The end of the anti-Japanese war in 1945 saw waves of returnees from the interior flood into cities formerly under Japanese control. Between 1945 and 1948, Shanghai's total population grew from 3.3 million to 5.4 million, an increase of over 60 percent. Housing shortages were acute and poverty rife, exacerbated by runaway inflation. It was the era of subdivided apartments and shared space, with rented apartments being divided up into small rooms and rooms into smaller living spaces. The sub-landlord, or Ar Fangdong, became a major figure in art and literature. 
Many tenants were just one missed rent payment away from the type of street destitution represented in Wanderings of Three Hairs the Orphan, a film from 1949. Films like Diary of a Homecoming from 1947 dramatize the high hopes and disappointed expectations of people returning to Shanghai after the war, hoping to find a home in which to make a new start. In that film, a married couple ends up sleeping under a friend's bed in an overcrowded attic accessible only by ladder and trap door. The device of having many families under one roof also appears in the play The House of 72 Tenants, which was made into films in China in 1963 and in Hong Kong in 1973, in which a group of tenants band together to defy those who try to exploit and evict them. The scenario was revived in Kung Fu Hustle from 2004 and 72 Tenants of Prosperity from 2010. As these filmmakers recognized, the multifamily apartment in its very form harbors narrative potential as a refuge for people from all walks of life, be they communists, traitors, or retired martial arts heroes. The apartment drama form tends to focus on the typicality of daily life in multifamily housing. Such dramas focus on familiar concerns, while offering windows into the domestic situations of all types of people. Film historian Zhu Bin Hu writes that with a few exceptions, in late 1940s China, the only popular film genre was family melodrama. To this, apartment films add variety, multiple family dramas for the price of one. The space concentrates not just people, but also secrets and stories. Collisions and conflicts abound in cramped spaces. Eavesdropping propels the action. In an early scene, Mr. Hua wants to burn the magazines that could get him arrested. Mrs. Hua wants to sell them to the paper recycler she hears outside the window, since they don't have enough cash for groceries. Hallway conversations, such as Ho booking plane tickets to Hong Kong, are overheard by others. Ah Mei, who sleeps in the hallway on the second floor, is often the first to share news about her employers, while little broadcast Xiao is ever ready with the latest rumors from outside. The filmmakers, working primarily with interiors, make extensive use of high-angle and low-angle shots to convey the power relationship between upstairs and downstairs. They also make extensive use of motivated camera movements prompted by character actions, such as rapid tracks and pans. Like Fei Mu's Spring in a Small Town, Crows and Sparrows also makes excellent use of deep space and multiple planes of action to create dramatic irony. In broad historical terms, the ensemble cast acts out a collective story of the age. All the principals, even the villains, are in a state of economic desperation. The Xiaos live hand to mouth and risk ruin daily as commodity speculators. The Huas are dependent on a teacher's salary in a school where teachers are on strike. Mr. Kong has lost his property and is barely hanging on to his editing job. A servant like Ah Mei could find herself dismissed and homeless in a heartbeat. Ho, meanwhile, is in a rush to grab what he can and convert it all into portable wealth, such as gold or jewelry, before making an escape. Just as time is running out for Ho and his ilk, the deadline he sets for eviction creates a second level of temporal pressure to compress the plot. These neighbors offer a concentrated variety of backgrounds, motivations, and personalities. Boss Xiao and Mrs. Xiao are schemers and petty business people. The canned goods they sell include carnation products, likely evaporated milk, Texun oranges, and Atlantic Coast herring, all allusions to the American economic presence in 1940s China. They also hoard expensive drugs such as penicillin. Though not so unscrupulous as to hurt people intentionally, they are willing to make deals with shady characters. Their hoarding represents a behavior that could be considered symptomatic of an age of inflation and uncertainty, in which commodities held their value much better than currency. The old widower who is the true owner of the row house has the ponderous name of Kong Yo Wen, cultured Confucius. Mr. Kong is an editor at a publishing house who now sees in every newspaper story two words, chaos, luan, and inflation, zhang. This property owner, however, is played as a member of the class of dispossessed commoners, as a vulnerable victim. He is also a veteran witness to injustice, who has made a career of recording it so far as journalism censorship allows. He is jaded, cynical, and pessimistic, beaten down by decades of misfortune, including the political persecution of his son. Old and physically frail, he seethes with righteous indignation 
and curses Ho's retreating back once the residents of his home finally stand behind him. He is an object of sympathy and estimation, a survivor. Like old Mrs. Zhang in Spring River Flows East, he provides ballast to the moral drama as a long-suffering stoic elder. Mr. Hua represents the harried state of intellectuals under the Republic of China, cowed by the paranoia of anti-communist and other ideological purges. The first we see of him, he is in his apartment burning magazines, including The Observer, Guan Cha, a nonpartisan intellectual magazine that was shut down by the nationalists in December 1948, which is roughly when the film opens. Other residents look up to Mr. Hua as an intellectual, but he is at first timid and passive, given to talk rather than action. He encourages Mr. Kong not to be so pessimistic and advises him that his day will come. When Ba Xiao nominates Mr. Hua to confront Ho about moving expenses, however, he tells Xiao to take the lead and that the rest of them will act as backup. At school, Mr. Hua lends oral support to the teacher's protest, but is reluctant to sign his name. Notably, however, he and the other teachers, when alone, declare themselves not once but twice to be not communist but rather non-partisan liberals. Wu Dang Wu Pai de Ziyo Fenzi. Though promoted as a collective work, this film benefits from strong performances by its stars. Zhao Dan, who starred in Crossroads and Street Angels, reappears as part of a charismatic comic couple. Wu Yin had starred in Spring River Flows East in the rather cliched role of old Mrs. Zhang. In Crows, the pair create fantastic chemistry with their non-stop repartee of bickering, negotiation, singing, scheming, and interacting with neighbors. One of Zhao Dan's best scenes has Xiao rocking in his chair daydreaming of a future windfall until with a guffaw, I'm rich, his chair collapses and he's showered with cans. Even in despair, Xiao manages irony. At one point he says, I'm finished, my money has been stabilized away. Wien also delivers a dynamic and compelling performance as the exasperated, sharp-tongued, calculating, moody, but ultimately very capable and strong-minded Mrs. Xiao. These characters are not just individuals, but also representatives of typical mindsets and behaviors. In one allegorical scene, the Xiaos are walking through the rain at night to get to the central bank so that they can change their currency for gold when it opens the next morning. They pass a line of blind men walking in the same direction, and little broadcast, or Ba Xiao, remarks, Look, even blind men are speculating in gold. This gossip-prone Xiao might as well be speaking of himself. In this age of rumors and wild speculation, the Xiaos are as blind as anyone else. Indeed, in the following riot, instigated by a black market gang, they end up barehanded and bloodied. Besides showing us various types of people, Crows and Sparrows also pursues a documentary agenda of showing the incriminating paper evidence of the economic and political villainy of the recently vanquished regime. Various texts fill the film, from major newspapers such as Da Gong Bao, to intellectual magazines such as The Observer, to government letters and documents. We see the Nanjing government tearing down maps and burning its military defense plans before fleeing south. The small collective drama of a group of neighbors is interspersed at regular intervals with close-up shots that linger on the incontrovertible evidence of the larger drama afoot.